What's going on, guys? Welcome back to WWE Network and show where I, Graham Gius and Matthews, break down all the original content I watch on the WWE Network. Today, we're talking the latest episode of Table for Three called Impactful Reunion featuring Sting, Jeff Jarrett, and AJ Styles. So when I was breaking down WWE Day of yesterday, I completely forgot about this episode of Table for Three airing after Raw last night on Monday Night on the Network. And um, <clears throat> I had seen it maybe on Friday or Saturday advertised. For some reason, I just completely forgot it was airing until late last night when I saw it on the network after Raw ended. And I was pleasantly surprised because this was a great episode. Now, the Table for Three shows are always enjoyable. This one specifically so. Just because we see footage on, I mean, obviously, as you could tell from the title of this episode, it's all about Impact Wrestling, TNA to be specific, which sounds absolutely crazy that we would get a TNA-centric show on the network, but in 2019, when we've had all this crazy shit happen, I, I can't say I'm surprised anymore. I would love to say that, actually, but I am, because I, I saw this advertised and I was like, that's crazy, and it's fucking awesome. Now, this is not the first time they've done something like this. I don't know if they've done a TNA-centric episode before with Table for Three. Um, they talked a lot about TNA on a lot of different network shows last year. There was like a phase where they talked about it on Table for Three. It wasn't all about TNA, but like Kurt Angle's matches were brought up. Um, I think maybe with AJ Styles, I want to say, here on, on Table for Three. And they showed footage of their matches, and it was awesome. Um, it might have been, I think it was a Table for Three actually with Shane and AJ, uh, Shane and Kurt, and then Kurt and AJ. So all three of those guys were talking about their respective histories, and AJ and Kurt talked about their matches in TNA, which were fucking awesome. Uh, Shane, we never really got that. Actually, we did get that match in WWE. We got it on that SmackDown. I think that I was there for, actually, before WrestleMania this year, albeit it lasted a minute. Um, but we did technically get the match in WWE. Nonetheless, um, this episode was all about impact. It wasn't like some shot shown, like with the broken Hardy stuff. Um, they did an episode with the Hardy Boys and maybe Finn Balor, I want to say, and someone else where they showed a lot of impact footage of the Broken Saga stuff. But this episode was all about impact, which was cool. They did a Bruce Pritchard podcast on the network, um, something else to wrestle with about a year and a half ago, which was a really good show. They never renewed it. Bruce is back with the company now, so maybe he's just busy doing that and his own podcast. I don't know. I'm not even sure if he's still doing his own podcast. As far as I know, I don't I don't think so. Maybe he's not doing the live shows anymore. I don't know. But they talked all about AJ's run in TNA and where it went wrong from 2010 through 2013 when he left and when Hogan came in and all that other stuff, which was fascinating. Um, but yeah, for the first time, we have a TNA, all about TNA show on the network, which was really, really cool. Did not get as much footage as, as, much footage as I would have liked on this episode, but hey, it's better than nothing. Again, in 2019, anything is better than nothing when it comes to this type of stuff. Um, this was just a really strong show. So it obviously takes place over WrestleMania week, and that's actually where I met Sting, was over WrestleMania 35 weekend in Brooklyn at WrestleMania Access. I almost met him at an indie show about three years ago, but it didn't work out, so it took me about three years to finally meet him. I did this year. He was really, really nice. Um, so Jarrett's there. He's obviously back working with WWE now, and AJ's there as a performer, of course. So Jeff Jarrett, to start off the episode, talks about, uh, he tells a story of how he first met Sting many, many years ago when he was 14 or 15 on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, Sting and the Ultimate Warrior, actually, came over to his house, I mean, uh, his dad's house, whatever, to talk to his dad, because uh, they were working for his dad, Jerry Jarrett, at the time. And Jerry brought him over to basically fire them in person, which is kind of funny. Not really, but I mean, in retrospect, it is. But he wasn't going to only just hire them and then fire them. He was going to place them in a different promotion, that being Bill Watts' territory, because uh, Jerry Jarrett told them that um, Bill Watts was a big... Big guy, if that makes sense. He was big on the big guys, and, and Sting and Warrior were big guys. Uh, so Jarrett ended up calling him about TNA many years later, and they get back to that a little later on. Um, Styles talks about the first time that he met Sting and Jarrett, because Jarrett brings up, "Hey, did you? When did you meet first? When did you first meet Sting? Was it in TNA? Was it before that?" Um, I'm not sure if AJ met him during his short stint in WCW. I don't. Mm, he didn't really clarify, but he did say, which I never knew. He said he never told this story before. He actually portrayed an ambulance driver on an episode of Nitro in the early 
uh, in early 2000, I think, and he got beat up by none other than Jeff Jarrett. So that was the first time that AJ met Jeff Jarrett. Jeff Jarrett has obviously no recollection of this. It was a throwaway angle on an episode of Nitro 20 years ago, so I can't say I'm surprised or that I blame him, but it was cool anyway. Um, AJ Styles talks about how being from Georgia, he was obviously a big WCW fan. He had that short stint in WCW, which lasted all of five months because they closed right after that. And his contract, thankfully, did not carry over to WWE. And I say thankfully because he even outright admits he was not ready for that stage of his career yet to be in WWE. The timing was way off. Had he gone there at that point, he would have floundered and he never would. I, I honestly, I mean, you never know. I really don't think, though, he would have been successful. I really don't think that he would have been, uh, he would have done all that well there because they had Booker T, they had other big stars come in, the NWO came in eventually. Um, They were also grooming, and remember in 2002, John Cena, Brock Lesnar, Randy Orton, Batista, Rey Mysterio, and many, many others, Shelton Benjamin to a lesser extent. Um, They were grooming a lot of different people. I think actually Shelton came in in early 2003, but still, my point still stands, that they were focusing on so many other people, that if AJ came in at that point, in early 2000 and what, 2001, late 2001, it just would not have worked, he would have been another dude to get his ass kicked during the invasion at that point, Sting is also talking about here, the closure of WCW after Jarrett brings it up, um, how he went from being this big focal point on Nitro every single week to just kind of disappearing into the night for a little while. Sting was not seen in wrestling for about two years after that. I mean, WCW closed in 2001, and I don't think he first appeared for TNA until 2003. TNA started in 02. I don't think Sting was there at the very from the very get-go. I think it took him a little while to come on over. Um, and Jared even brings up how he didn't know what to do with his life after WCW closed, and I mean, obviously, a lot of contracts carried over to WWE, but I forgot where it was. I think it was on one of those untold shows, I think, um, where, you know, it wasn't Jarrett himself. It was someone else, maybe Shane or someone like that. Michael P.S. Hayes, perhaps. I don't remember exactly. But they brought up how when Vince announced on TV, that I mean, it was obviously known before that, that they were purchasing WCW and all this other stuff. Um, but anyway, so he talks about that and how Jarrett knew kind of from that moment that he was not going to get a job back with WWE because he didn't leave on the best of terms in, uh, what was it, 1999, No Mercy, and that match with China, the good housekeeping match. He left on terrible terms. So Vince, not only did he not want to bring him back to WWE, he even said on the show itself that Jarrett was F I double R E double D fired, or however he spelled it on the show. And I forgot who had said they were standing right next to Jarrett when Vince said that on the Tron. It was probably Shane. And Jarrett was like, well, I got to go look for another job because he knew he wasn't going back to WWE at that point. Um, So he put the plans together to start up TNA. And he kind of looked at the landscape of the talent out there and kind of like assessed his skills as an entrepreneur and uh, went forward with the idea of putting together a second-tier promotion next to WWE, a, a, uh, an alternative of sorts, another option for wrestlers that either wanted to leave WWE or people that weren't getting an opportunity in WWE, people like AJ Styles, Christopher Daniels, who didn't go over to... Uh, um, I mean, he was in he was in Ring of Honor uh, more over than anything else. Uh, Samoa Joe, same thing with him. And AJ talked about how... It was really Jeff Jarrett's dad, actually, Jerry Jarrett, that approved AJ Styles at a Nashville show. I think AJ said that he was there for an indie show. He thought he was there for an indie show. It was kind of like a tryout of sorts. And Jerry Jarrett kind of gave him the stamp of approval that they wanted AJ Styles. So um, AJ was doing a show over in Australia, I think with Jeff Jarrett there, or he was on the show. I don't remember. But it was there that Jeff Jarrett offered him a contract to join TNA. And then AJ kind of had, you know, took it with a grain of salt because you hear all the time. These performers talk about it constantly, especially recently with all the AEW talk, which is obviously a successful promotion. But he didn't expect much at first because you hear this stuff all the time about how, you know, this promotion's starting up. It's going to be the next big thing in wrestling, brother. And TNA was for a little while anyway. And AJ uh, was aboard from the, uh, from the get-go and became their featured star soon after that. Um, so we also talked about how he was kind of among the core wrestlers in TNA. Um, Jared didn't really mention anyone else. I was hoping he would bring up, you know, some, Samoa Joe's with the fucking company. So why wouldn't you bring up Samoa Joe or Christopher Daniels? I mean, I know he's not with, you know, WWE, um, or really even Ring of Honor anymore. He's with the competition. He's in AEW. 
Um, but they brought up Awesome Kong, and I guess they filmed this before um, Double or Nothing, where she debuted. So it was okay to bring up Awesome Kong, but maybe because Christopher Daniels was already in AEW, they didn't want to mention him, I don't know. I'm probably overanalyzing this, but I was surprised they only really said that AJ was among the core competitors in TNA from that start, uh, when there was obviously very more beyond, there was, there was a lot more just beyond AJ Styles. Um, Jared admits that getting Sting to TNA was very hard, not on Sting's part, um, but it, it was difficult to bring him in because he was such a big name. AJ was even shocked that um, Sting was brought in because he's such a big name. Like, what the hell is this guy doing here? Like, not that I'm complaining, but like, what the hell is Sting doing in TNA of all places, you know? Um, Jared brought up how the X Division wasn't really traditional wrestling, but it was a good thing because it really helped them stand out. And he actually credits Vince Russo, and he mentions him by name, that he helped them stand out from WWE, helped them be as different as possible, and really establish an identity for themselves, uh, you know, uh, separate from WWE, from what they were doing with their product at that point in time. They talked about the move to Fox Sports Net uh, back in, what, 2002, 2003, maybe? Maybe 04, because they went to Spike right after, and they talked about that too, about how they were kind of gradually, slowly, but surely moving up in the world from Fox Sports Net, which wasn't a big, big deal at the time, but it was a big deal to TNA to have a platform to perform and have their show air on and stuff like that. They left there for Spike TV, I want to say in 2005, right after they dropped Raw, right after they dropped WWE, so Spike still wanted wrestling at that point, so they picked up TNA, and it gave the wrestlers a lot more fire to know that they were, you know, what they were doing was paying off. They were a success to a certain extent, and that it was going to give them more motivation to go out there and have great matches. So it was kind of all, all a recipe for success back at that point. Uh, they brought up how Christian was really the first ex-WWE star to be brought in. And now um, AJ praises him. He said he was a really cool dude. It was shocking for AJ to see him in TNA, how it really kind of set the tone for Kurt Angle to come on in, which was also shocking for AJ. But it really legitimized TNA as a company that, wow, this is a real, maybe not competition for WWE, but a real alternative to what WWE was doing because Kurt and Christian wasted no time in coming to TNA right after WWE. Christian's WWE contract expired um, in late 2005. He was TNA, He was in TNA probably by the end of 05, if I remember correctly, if not early 06. Kurt was there right afterward. He left in August, and I think as soon as his 90-day non-compete clause was up, maybe, um, he arrived in TNA in that segment with Samoa Joe. That's still among their greatest moments of all time. And, and not just impact history, but just all time wrestling history. It's such a great fucking moment when Kurt Angle debuted and went face to face with Samoa Joe and they got physical, just a really great moment in, in wrestling history. Really. Um, Jared says that him and Sting, I forgot what pay-per-view it was probably from around that point. Oh, five, oh six had their most pay-per-view buys ever which I don't believe that to be true. I believe Jarrett might just be uh, blowing smoke up his own ass. As far as I'm concerned, and I haven't seen any real numbers regarding this. I mean, I have, and I've seen a lot of uh, you know data backing this fact up. I'm, again, I don't work for them, so I don't know. <clears throat> I've never worked for Impact Wrestling, so maybe he's right. He would know better than I would, I guess. I just kind of feel like he's embellishing the story here. Where he brings up that his match um, with Sting, the Jarrett Sting main event at whatever pay-per-view it was back at that point, had the most pay-per-view buys of all time. I thought it was Samoa Joe versus Kurt Angle. Maybe I'm wrong, um, but I'm pretty sure that was the highest, you know, the most successful show, the most successful main event they've ever had because people were super hyped for Joe and Angle. But again, I might be wrong. Maybe he's talking about up to that point that Jarrett and Sting was their highest pay-per-view record by whatever. Um, and Maybe he's right. Maybe it is of all time, but I thought it was really, I, I thought it was Joe and Angle, but maybe he's referring to up to that point in time. It doesn't really matter, but um, Sting also talks about the face paint that he had in TNA um, and in WCW and the issues that he's had with it over the years and forgetting to put it on for one match in WCW early on in his career many years ago. Um, and he also brings up how it, it has its pros and cons. AJ said that he can never, he really wanted to wear face paint at one point, I guess he said, early on in his career. But then he soon realized, I'm going to have to put it on and take it off every single night. And he just can't do that. And Sting says, well, you know, it is it, it is kind of a pain in the ass, but he was told by someone in the merchandise company, the merchandise department in WWE, that his shirts with his face on it were the highest selling piece of merchandise over WrestleMania 35 weekend in San Jose. With the kids, with kids, it was the highest selling shirt that weekend because kids didn't even know who Sting was, but they loved the face paint. 
The guy was a merchandise machine. From WCW to TNA, even in WWE, the guy was still selling shirts and masks because people love the fucking face paint. AJ recalls the asylum years in TNA. He, he talks about a ladder match that he had with uh, Low Key and Jerry Lynn, a triple threat ladder match in one of those early NWA TNA pay per view shows, um, and how great of a match that was. Jeff Jarrett also brings up the AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, Christopher Daniels triple threat match. Very happy they acknowledged that because that match was probably the best match in Impact's history, and they've had a lot of great matches with Joe and Angle and other people. But I think that's the match they're most known for, even almost 15 years later, uh, which is insane to me. But yeah, that triple threat match from Unbreakable 2005 is absolutely amazing. If you've never seen it, you're doing yourself a huge disservice. Um, But AJ talked about it was a huge deal for all three of them, him, Joe, and Daniels, and how it worked because AJ was still, you know, he was kind of the the core of that X division at that point. Daniels was proving he still had it, even after, you know, having an established, successful career in wrestling. And Joe was undefeated at that point. He had come in undefeated. He remained undefeated until that feud with uh, Kurt Angle about a year later, uh, which was pretty cool. So he was undefeated for a long time, including in his time in TNA. Samoa Joe has had a lot of undefeated streaks in, in, in his wrestling career between TNA and Ring of Honor. Um, but Sting talked about, you know, Jared asks him, who did you enjoy working with the most? Um, he talked about Abyss early on, uh, Jeff Jarrett himself, Kurt Angle, uh, including the Empty Arena match, which apparently broke some records for them uh, in February of 2009. I remember watching that. I started watching Impact in the summer, the August, the month of August in 2008, and that happened in February of 2009 when the Main Event Mafia members were feuding for whatever reason. And um, Jarrett brought up how that broke a record for them. It was a really high number in the, uh, in, in the not the demos maybe, but like the, uh, it, it happened half, like halfway through the episode. So, Whatever episode that was, the rating like peaked at that point with like millions of viewers, which I guess was uh, obviously a very, <clears throat> excuse me, a very big deal for them at that point. And Sting also brings up the main event mafia, which I was really happy to see him acknowledge. I was a big main event mafia guy. I thought they had a great run. It was him, Kurt, Booker T, Scott Steiner, and Kevin Nash. And they added in later like Samoa Joe as an, as an honorable mention. They had another run years later with like Sting, Magnus, Joe, and Angle, and people like that, which was also cool. But the original main event Mafia, which probably should not have ever worked just because it was all guys that were well past their prime at that point, it worked, and it was it was a really good idea. Um, and it was a great heel stable for TNA for the year that it lasted for. Um, Sting says he especially loved switching up his character as Joker Sting. Now, personally, I was never a fan of Joker Sting. Maybe I'll appreciate it more if I watched it back, and I was a big Heath Ledger Joker fan, I thought he had an amazing Joker, is it better than uh, Joaquin Phoenix's Joker, that's really up for debate, Um, but the Joker Sting I was never a big fan of, I just thought it was stupid, and it even brings it up that that the Joker Sting character was received um, very divisively, if that's even a word, it had a very divisive reaction in the United States, uh, where people either loved it or they hated it. I remember the reaction to the character at that point early on in my social media days in like 2011 where people were like either they hated it or they loved it. I did not like that character. But there were a lot of people that loved it. I actually have a Joker Sting t-shirt. Not that I bought it. I actually won it at a TNA show five years ago. Uh, I won some contests by tweeting about the show while I was at the tapings and they gave me a free shirt. I couldn't really pick what it was so they gave me a free Sting shirt. Um, and I actually gave it to I actually gave it to Alexis recently, which is pretty funny. And she loves the shirt because she loves the Joker. But it was really fucking cool. Um, so anyway, yes, yeah, he brings that up and um, and uh, yeah, how the Joker Sting stuff. England loved it. England was a big. They're big fans of the Joker stuff, and how every time he still goes over there to this day, they hope that he's doing the Joker Sting face paint because it's still uh, beloved to this day, which is pretty fucking cool. And obviously, probably caught wind again with Joker coming out just recently. Um, he won't be able to do it again, but he kind of tapped into that character a little bit in WWE um, during that feud with Seth. He wasn't as quiet as he was during the feud with uh, Triple H. Um, but yeah, he, he, I, I, it was cool to hear him talk about the uh, Joker Sting stuff. We actually see footage of him doing the character in a backstage segment in Eric Bischoff's office, which was kind of funny. But he also brought up that he wished that TNA had a better budget because there was a lot of stuff that wasn't caught on camera because they, they only had one camera to catch reactions from everyone in the ring. Not, you know, they couldn't go around rapidly to catch everyone's reactions 
to what Joker's thing was doing. So he said a lot of the best stuff that he did was not even seen. Jared, I was very happy he brought this up. He mentions the Gail Kim Awesome Kong matches from, I want to say, 2007 over the Impact Knockouts Championship. I think the first real feud they did over that championship was with Gail Kim and Awesome Kong, and they had some awesome fucking matches, no pun intended. Really put their women's division on the map and was far better than anything WWE was doing at that point. Um, with the Divas division and stuff like that. And Jarrett kind of brings up how that, that ties into his next point here, how they really strived to be as different from WWE as possible with the women, their X division, X, Y, and Z, including the six-sided ring, another very divisive thing where people either loved it or they hated it. And he said that toy stores, that was the only thing they wanted. They only really, they didn't care about the talent. They didn't care about the superstars they had. They cared about the six-sided ring because it was different. They could sell it. They could make money off of it. And I'm sure they did. Sting says he hated it because he was so used to the four-sided ring. After so many years, he just couldn't really get used to the six-sided ring. Um, Styles, on the other hand, absolutely loved it because he loved how it made them different. And he was very vocal about when they lost in 2010 when Hulk Hogan was brought into the fold that he was pissed off. That, um, that they had lost the um, six-sided ring. They were back to the traditional four sides. And they actually brought it back in 2014 after Impact was going through a reboot phase again. Um, and I think they got rid of it after that. Maybe, I want to say, when did they go back to the four sides? Like maybe 2017, 2018? At least in the last couple of years, and it was for the better. They had to get rid of the six fucking sides because it was. I could see how it made them different, but it was also. It just looks stupid, and um, a lot of people were getting hurt on it. It's just not. It's not safe to work in. So I'm glad they went back to the four sides. It's just more traditional. I can appreciate their intent to be different, but there are other ways of accomplishing that than having a six sided ring. At this point, people just want it back because it's nostalgia. But uh, anyway. Um, so Sting was not complaining. He said Sting had said that he was not complaining when they had to get rid of it because of Hulk Hogan. Hulk Hogan said it just wasn't right. It wasn't right, brother. And it changed the dynamic of everything because it was so different than uh, what people could do in the four sides. Anyway, so Jarrett, no pun intended here, talks about the impact that they had on the industry and how he was very grateful for that time in his career and how it was, again, very different from what WWE was doing in the early to mid-2000s. Sting talks about how it was a very good memory for him being in TNA and how he had more fun there than people had any idea of and how he could be a little heelish with the stuff that he could do and how his real personality came out during those Joker Sting days. As for Styles, he said that he matured there and wish he was more mature while he was there to kind of see that they were building a business and he kind of reacted certain ways that he not really regrets in hindsight, but he wished he could have, uh, you know, responded better than he did. But he definitely matured there. And had he gone to WWE first, we would not be seeing, in my opinion, the same styles we see today. The guy was always an amazing talent, a -a once-in-a-lifetime talent. Um, At the same time, though, I think it meant more for him to leave, not leave, but never to come to WWE before he did in 2016 because he was able to build that brand for himself, build a legacy outside of WWE, in TNA, in Ring of Honor, in Japan, before finally coming over, making an impact, pun intended that time, and having this amazing career renaissance for himself in WWE that's still going on to this day. Former multi-time United States champion, multi-time WWE champion, you know, multiple great matches at WrestleMania and stuff like that. He said that his time at TNA made him who he is today. And that he learned a lot from the talent that he stepped in the ring with during that period of his career. And then to close it out, Styles says that he loves Jared, he loves Sting, they all love each other, and they all... You know, praise each other to end the episode. So I thought this was great. I really enjoyed this episode of Table for Three. Um, Moreover than anything else, it's just so fucking cool to see TNA footage on the WWE Network. It's just fucking cool. It's really, really cool. I will never not get used to that. So obviously they have the plugs for Impact Plus, which they did for the other pieces of content they had on the network involving TNA last year. Um, But at that point, it was the Global Wrestling Network, so it's kind of outdated. Um, now they're the Impact Plus service, which is a great service. If you're not already subscribed, definitely do so. Um, they have some great shows up there, including some of the shows you saw on this very episode of Table for Three. But um, yeah, check it out on the WWE Network Impactful Reunion featuring Sting, Jeff Jarrett, and AJ Styles. So my review lasted longer than the actual episode did. The actual episode lasted around 21 minutes. My review was well over that point, so I, I apologize for kind of dragging it along here, but uh, definitely check it out on the network at your leisure. 
As for me, folks, be sure to like the video, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more content. We'll be back, like I said, on Friday with my review of the Season 9 finale of Total Divas. Um, I had said the Season 1 finale, I, the Season 1 finale, I have no idea why, but it is the Season 9 finale coming up tonight on the network, breaking it down right here on Network and Show this Friday on the channel. And then after that, all new Chronicle of Rey Mysterio on Saturday, talking about that on Sunday, and then all new... Um, what is it, Broken Skull Sessions with Stone Cold Steve Austin and Goldberg on Sunday, breaking that down hopefully on Monday of next week. Until next time, guys, have a great rest of your week. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.